better. Zen, it's a pleasure and privilege to be with you here at the American Society of Hematology meeting in Atlanta, Georgia. As you know, there are more than 20,000 hematologists here for uh, this annual meeting. And it, uh, it's a kind of a chaotic scene, as you yourself and I spoke about just a few minutes ago. Rushing from uh, meeting to meeting and paper presentations, symposia, etc. But it's a chance to also see old friends and uh, make sure that we're absolutely up to date on the monoproliferative neoplasms. You asked me whether or not I thought that these diseases are curable as of 2012. And I regret to say that they are not, but there are very few diseases in medicine that are curable. For example, heart disease is not curable, hypertension, diabetes, lung disease, peptic ulcer. The only thing that's curable is appendicitis. I tell my students and my fellows, you cut out the appendix and throw, away, throw it away, then it never grows back. So the most important thing as a physician is that we feel that we can treat people. And the most important aspect of that is that we can put people into remission so that they feel well. And I liken the situation to a nearsighted person. You, a person can be nearsighted and be given glasses and they see perfectly well. And uh, the same thing is true of diabetes. They take insulin and the patients are, are, um, can lead a perfectly normal life. <coughs> I think that the most significant advances in the, in the past five years is that uh, we have understood the biology of this disease with, with the JAK uh, V617F mutation, and this has stimulated an enormous amount of, of uh, laboratory work and clinical interest. And I, I dare say probably there are more hematologists working in the field of uh, myeloproliferative diseases now than the patients suffering from it. Uh, the fact is that we can induce clinical remission in the great majority of patients with polycythemia vera and certainly essential thrombocythemia. And as you know, I'm a great believer in low-dose interferon uh, because of the fact that this has a biologic reason for its use. It affects erythroid production, that's red cell production, it affects megakaryocytes. We believe that megakaryocytes are central to the development of fibrosis in the bone marrow. And that's why we had the idea of using low-dose interferon very early in patients with myelofibrosis. Uh, in contrast, drugs such as hydroxyurea are nonspecific cell poisons, and whereas they can induce a clinical remission, they don't have a biologic basis for their use. And these drugs, just like any other chemotherapeutic agent, are toxic. Uh, the problem <coughs> uh, with the use of the more widespread use of interferon in, in the United States relates to the fact that the doses that many hematologists use until uh, recently, and hopefully my influence, was related to the fact that they were the kind used in chronic myeloid leukemia. They're very, very high, more than 10 times the dose we recommend in polycythemia vera. And it's of interest that there has been a resurgence of the use of interferon in chronic myeloid leukemia because not all patients develop a, a significant molecular remission in that disease. And so there's another interest, once again, in using low-dose interferon in, in treating that illness. I might say that uh, the French, uh, Dr. Kalaji and my colleague, and uh, uh, Dr. Hasselbach in Scandinavia, uh, specifically Denmark, they're great believers in the use of interferon. Odd data uh, compared to the French and the D Danish data, the Scandinavian data, is almost identical. There is a remarkable freedom from thrombosis, and we believe that's due to the effect of uh, interferon on the vascular integrity of the capillary bed. It may also be due to adhesion molecules. It may be due to effect on granulocytes and activated platelets. And there are a whole host of factors why we see such remarkable uh, freedom from these thrombotic events that others, particularly uh, groups in Europe, have not observed.